Petra, the ruins of the ancient kingdom of Nabatea, located in what is now the country of Jordan. Over 3,000 years ago, according to the Bible, the prophet Moses supposedly struck a rock roughly a kilometer from this spot, making water gush forth to quench the thirst of the wandering Israelites. That spring continued to flow over the years, supplying a local community that eventually evolved to become the kingdom of Nabatea. As reported by the Jordanian Tourism Bureau, that spring flows to this day in the present community known as Wadi Musa, or Valley of Moses. Strategically located near both the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Ocean, as well as the crossroads of several caravan trails, the Nabataean Kingdom became a thriving hub of commerce, serving the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. Its inhabitants flourished in a secluded valley protected by a natural defensive barrier formed by jagged mountains that circled the kingdom. The main entrance to Petra wound its way through a kilometer-long, narrow gorge etched by Mother Nature between sheer cliffs and made popular with modern adventurists when it was portrayed in the Indiana Jones film Temple of Doom. After passing through this narrow passageway, the visitor is immediately confronted with one of the most spectacular, well-preserved examples of Nabataean architecture, the Treasury Building. It's uncertain where the structure received this moniker, as it was eventually revealed to contain four tombs below, with the upper structure likely serving as an honorarium for Nabataean King Aretas IV. It had no relation to finance. This work of art was estimated to have been carved out of rock around the time of Jesus Christ. From here, the gorge widens considerably, revealing multiple rows of tombs carved into the cliff face on either side. Although there are dozens upon dozens of tombs scattered throughout this area, what immediately catches the traveler's eyes are those burial sites possessing the towering, ornate facades that loom above the valley. Although the structures appear immense, rooms for the most part are only found at ground level, the remainder of the structure serving only aesthetic purposes. It may seem odd today to find such an expansive necropolis located on the main thoroughfare leading into the city, but such a layout was common during the age of Greco-Roman influence. Continuing further along this narrow valley, the burial grounds begin to mingle with habitation as tombs give way to domiciles carved into the rock. A theater etched into stone provides insight into local entertainment of that era.
As the valley opens out into the wide basin that forms the central portion of the city Petra, a row of tombs with gigantic facades stretches off to the right. These burial monuments are not only huge in stature, but detailed in both architecture and ornate decoration. This earned them the title of royal tombs, although historians have since proved that to be an incorrect designation. One of the most spectacular of these honorariums is the Tomb of the Urn. It differs from the other tombs in two ways. First, it is set back into the mountain, creating a courtyard at its front with two small porticos on the sides. Second, the creators extended this courtyard into the valley by building a platform supported by vaulted rooms beneath. Although not certain, it is believed that this was the tomb of King Malakos II, who reigned in the first century AD. In the fifth century, the tomb was converted to a Christian church and received a few modifications, which included the large opening into the second story. Another uniquely impressive tomb is the structure known as the Palace Tomb. It is unlike any other Nabataean design, ornate and elaborately complex in its motif. Resembling a palace along the lines of Hellenistic or Roman architecture, some believe it was patterned after the extravagant palace of Nero in Rome. The facade of this resting place is 49 meters wide and more than 45 meters tall. This makes the Palace Tomb one of the largest carved structures in Petra. Petra has experienced numerous religions over the course of its existence, its roots sprouting from the water summoned by Moses, growing through worship of Arab deities, expanding with Christianity, and eventually reaching the tenets of Islam. On a hillside overlooking the urban area of Petra is the remains of a Byzantine Christian church unearthed in the 1990s. Dating from the 5th century AD, it is likely that this place of worship was a cathedral that served as the seat of authority for the resident bishop in Petra. Although the center floor of the church did not fare well over time, the aisles on either side of the interior are relatively well preserved, ornately decorated with tiles depicting caricatures, animals, and other objects linked to Christianity. Unfortunately, the cathedral met its untimely demise when it burned in the 7th century. Below the church is the main thoroughfare of the city. A paved promenade runs through the heart of urban Petra, signifying its prominence for the community. This was the main area of habitation for the Nabataeans. It was the seat of government and the focus of commerce in the region. Central to this area are the remains of what is simply called the Large Temple. Built in the first century BC, it possessed a huge courtyard in the front. Tiled with hexagonal stone slabs, this large plaza is flanked on either side by porticos that still display the remnants of three rows of pillars each.
Like many structures in Petra, the name it acquired does not necessarily dictate its true purpose. The presence of an amphitheater in the temple building implies that it may at some point have been the seat of the city council, or perhaps an Odeon, a form of Roman theater. Further along the promenade is Petra's oldest remaining block and mortar building, the Qasr el Bin Faron, or in English, the Palace of the Pharaoh's Daughter. Most simply call it Qasr el Bint. Built in the first century BC, the temple was erected to worship the Nabataean deities of the day. It is really the only freestanding Nabataean structure built from the ground up that survived the test of 2,000 years of Mother Nature. The final excursion of the day is an arduous climb to the mountaintop of Jebel Ed Deer the site of one of the most well-preserved, impressive carved structures in the Nabataean Kingdom, the monastery. The trek to the structure is an exhaustive climb up a winding trail of seemingly never-ending switchbacks. Halfway up the trail is a narrow path that leads off to the left, ending at a carved edifice known as the Triclinium of the Lions. It was so named for the two carved lion designs that flanked the entrance on either side of this facade. Although the excavation appears to be a tomb, it is in fact a triclinear chamber, better known as a dining room. Returning to the climb, the trail wanders upwards, approaching the monastery from behind, entering into a wide, flat courtyard facing this impressive example of Nabataean architecture. Despite its name, this building was never used as a monastery. It was likely constructed as a temple or place of worship for one of the early Nabataean deities, possibly the deified monarch Abotus I, who lived during the first century BC. Later, during the Byzantine era, it was used as a church, perhaps leading to its present label as the monastery. And so, this wraps up a very long day of exploration in one of the most intriguing archaeological sites in the world a glimpse into a past civilization that emerged over 2,000 years ago, leaving behind architectural monuments that instill awe and amazement to this very day.